This is Behind the Curtain. Today we're learning how Ryan Johnson combines the whodunit and thriller genre, what the Walter White test Ryan gives the protagonist is, and the only advice Ryan Johnson thinks is worth a damn. Well, as I started thinking about the genre, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, Hitchcock hated whodunits famously, and his whole thing about whodunits was it's a big buildup to one big surprise at the end, which was a very cheap coin for him narratively. And that's why he was all about suspense. He's like, give them the information early and make them lean forward in their chair. And I, I love whodunits, and I fundamentally agree with Hitchcock. So the my idea approaching this was to kind of put the engine of a Hitchcock thriller in the middle of a whodunit. So hopefully we get all the great stuff we still love about whodunits. We get the questioning, we get kind of the old mansion and the eccentric family, mm -hmm. all the suspects, and we get the great scene at the end where the detective does the denouement in the library and lays it all out. But in the middle of it, we kind of have this more suspense-driven uh, Hitchcock thriller story that centers on Anna de Armas' character. And so with this, we do, you know, you, you can recognize we do the Columbo thing. We, we, we basically, um, with a couple of very crucial differences. The Columbo starts with the scene where the killer does the murder and you see who it is. And then it, that makes it suspense, not surprise. That mean, means there is no surprise. You know it and you're waiting to see how Columbo is going to catch him. Um, and so we kind of do that in this movie. Um, you kind of do something that starts as a whodunit, turns into a Hitchcock thriller, then turns back into a whodunit at the end. Then hopefully the feeling is that this whodunit has been hiding underneath this thriller the entire time and the thriller itself was just a bit of misdirection one of the really interesting things to me was okay what if you did the Columbo thing but the audience was genuinely on the side of the quote unquote killer CSI KFC if you're rooting for her to actually get away with it the fact that we know you know how these things work and we know that Blanc the detective always figures it out at the end and catches the the killer the very mechanics of the genre we're all familiar with become the antagonist of the movie even if the detective himself is a sympathetic character um, that's why I have Blanc say that line to her this machine unerringly arrives at the truth that's what it does that's why I love genre you know it gives you a it gives you a game board to play on. And then even just, you know, before I even start collaborating, even for writing for myself, um, having the boundaries and having kind of knowing, okay, we're, I love this kind of genre, so I'm going to try and do something that gives the audience the pure pleasure of what I love about it. Having that as like the goal, that then gives you, yeah, it gives you, it gives you a field to play on. It gives you a, a chessboard to work on, you know? You know, what I want is to eventually get to a place where we become nervous in terms of how far Marta is willing to go, how to cover her tracks, and is she willing to, is she going to hit a place where she's willing to do things just as bad as what the family is doing in order to win at the end of the day? I basically had gave her the Walter White choice of, like, you know, watching Jesse's girlfriend, watching Jane like dying, and he can do the right thing and save her, or he can just be passive and do nothing. And, uh, and, and that felt like interesting also in that moment with Marta where she's watching Fran die and she, she's a nurse and she has a medical bag and she can save her, but Fran has just told her, I know it was you, I'm gonna make you pay. I mean, the way that I write is I, um, you know, I write very structurally. I, I I start just kind of mapping it out, and I do think in, in I've trained myself to think in sequences, and so I, I draw a timeline. I write in the smaller moleskin notebooks, and I, I draw a timeline on one page, just an arc a line, and then I split it out with little you know uh, little vertical lines, and I kind of create my sequence of sequences. Um, and, and split into acts, basically. So I do like the structure thing. But those sequence, I, I'm not at that point even thinking in terms of, of plot. Um, I'm thinking in terms of story, I guess. Which is, like, it's a weird, I don't know how to exactly describe it. It's basically, I'm thinking in terms of the audience's experience and what's drawing an audience through 
sequence by sequence. For, for each sequence, what are they worried about? What are they leaning forward about? What's the big change that happens at the end of the sequence? And how does that change catapult us into the next thing? So it, it really is thinking as basic and fundamental as that. And then plot comes next. And yeah, the big plot thing to figure out where just, it's stuff like the mechanics of, of the morphine switch up. Like, how do you play that in such a way where... Uh, it fits the requirements, which is she has to believe she did it, we have to believe she did it, and I also need to be able to kind of undo it at the end in a way that makes sense. The trick is to have that slight bit of silliness, but at the same time, you don't want it to tip over into, oh, come on. You know, you don't, you don't want to break it, basically. It has something in common with time travel, I think, in movies, where... Yeah. It's, it's something that doesn't really make, I mean, it makes sense in terms of like the, the interior rules of it. It doesn't really make sense that someone would do this in order to, you know, in order to bump their grandfather off. But at the same time, within the telling of the story, it makes perfect sense. And probably more important within the genre that the audience knows the story is taking place in. It makes sense. This is the sort of thing people do in murder mysteries. And so we buy it. The only advice that I think is actually worth a damn is um, is to not get your head wrapped up in how do I break in, how do I make a career, how do I, what do I do to get an agent, what do I do to get into the industry. That that really is putting um, the cart before the horse. I really I really believe that your only job is to work on your voice and to work on just make as many movies as you can don't get precious don't worry about making them look professional don't worry about shooting with great equipment don't worry about any of that shoot with your phone use your friends as actors anything you do just make them make them make them make them make them and develop get better and better at telling a story with a camera and i really believe that like if you develop that and you get to the point where you're making interesting stuff and putting it out there that's the stuff that then attracts the industry to to you in some shape or form the story for me was about using each one of these characters as a different facet to explore honestly kind of you know in myself more than anything else um both privilege and also though a more fundamental thing than that which is kind of just that basic human thing of when something you believe is yours is threatened what how do you react to that and that kind of giving a very clear spotlight as to the moral compass of of every one of us and there's something about the murder mystery genre that is uniquely suited to looking at class i think because the murder mystery by its very nature it creates a little microcosm of society this contained group and then through all the suspects you're getting a cross section of that society from the high to the low and then investigating their relationship with the top of the power pyramid and so because of that it's something that by its very structure and nature is ideally suited to investigating class. Now what's interesting to me is the who done it is usually done in the context of a a period piece because it's usually an Agatha Christie thing so it's usually disconnected from our present time and b it's usually in Britain because again it's usually an Agatha Christie adaptation. And so the idea of taking this thing that was a great x-ray machine of that stuff and applying it to America in 2018 seemed like that could in addition to being very being very entertaining also kind of yield some interesting things because I grew up reading Agatha Christie because I'm just a whodunit junkie also I didn't have to go and do any real specific research for this it was more about just kind of investigating my own lifetime love of the genre and trying to kind of boil that down to its essence I guess there's a lot of math that goes into figuring out like all the connections and all the plotting and everything but I mean the analogy I, I always make is you know the work really goes into making sure that for the audience it feels like a roller coaster ride not a math problem and so making it feel simple even if it's complex um, and making it feel like one thing flows into another and you're having this ride that that that's it's where most of the work goes into even if your wall looks like you know the, a serial killer's wall you have to make sure the audience actually can stay oriented throughout the whole thing Really, what's satisfying is not the sense that um, you could solve it, although I guess technically you could. But what's satisfying is 
that at the end, every single payoff is something that you recognize. It's almost like a recognition game. And so in that big explanation at the end, every single thing he lays out is something we can flash back to and show that we did set up. And there's something very satisfying about that. So I was thinking more about that and less about how do I build this thing where the audience you know, has a chance of like solving it, you know. A much more useful place to write is not thinking in some meta way of where the audience's head is going to be, but really entirely thinking through the eyes of the characters that we're seeing the story through. So I think I would go a little crazy if I started doing all the math of what is the audience going to be thinking. Uh, it, it's much more, okay, what is Marta thinking? I, I got a couple like trusted friends that I show it to every time. My producer is someone I show it to, and then just writer friends, really, you know, people that you can like get that will really be honest with you because you want brutality in that phase. You don't want brutality, but you need brutality in that phase, you know. And then it's just working it over and over and over again, um, and just trying to, you know, just simplify, simplify, and just. Um, uh, but you know, it sounds like you're a writer, you know, it's, it's like a, the, the tough balance is always, you get notes from people and you realize trying to parse out with a very small uh, sample size what, uh, what notes you want to, what notes you need to, you need to get in there and do changes for and what notes are, you know, either personal preferences or quirks or how the person was feeling that day. That's the part that like, I feel like you never quite figure out. You always kind of just gotta do your best, you know? Hey, this is Nehemiah Jordan, the creator of Behind the Curtain. If you'd like to stay up to date with the channel, as well as see extra screenwriting related content, go ahead and follow me on Twitter. The link will be in the description. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week.